Okay, so I'll just do a very quick introduction of Danny, our speaker today. And uh, Danny Phillips is based in Melbourne. Uh, I met him last year through another connection. Uh, and he's the director of Arcade, which is a customer experience agency. Uh, he's got a master's qualification in communications uh, focused on advertising. And he lectures for a couple of our local uh, universities and uh, presents on customer experience related topics at various conferences. Uh, Danny is going to talk today about some of the priorities that he sees uh, for companies in the current times uh, because obviously digital commerce has become a topic of the moment and uh, sometimes it's just really difficult to pick what you should invest in first in terms of your time and resources. So without any further uh, explanation from me, I'll hand over to Danny to take it away. Thanks, Danny. No worries. Um, thanks for having me. Um, just to get things warmed up, um, we might use the polls uh, feature of Zoom um, during the meeting today. So we're just gonna throw a little test one out there to you now. Um, I think we'll, we'll see a poll pop up on your screen in a second. Um, just asking a bit, of, uh, a bit about what uh, cuisines if, for those that are coming uh, that are joining us from New Zealand specifically when you were completely locked down from a from takeaway food what was the one that you wanted um, that you craved the most out, out of the choices there um, and, and once you've finished answering those questions you'll see all the results come back up so yeah maybe just answer the question um, and I'll get into the start of uh, start of the talk and while you're doing that I'm just going to share my screen there you go, burgers. Interesting. Um, well, look to start to start my talk. I'm just going to do a bit of a um, uh, a case study around um, a little Mexican restaurant in Atlanta. Um, so uh, this this um, this Mexican cantina called the Rose Pepper Cantina is uh, located in Atlanta. Um, I went to this restaurant when I was over in um, Atlanta a year and a half ago visiting the MailChimp head office. Um, and it was quite a fun little place. It had an interesting sort of letterboard out the front and had a lot of little jokes going on. Um, but what's really interesting about, um, and I followed them on Instagram just because you know, I went there. It's a little bit of an interesting thing. But what I saw over the last few weeks really sort of epitomized what it means um, to listen to your customers. And yeah, I know the word pivot gets thrown around a lot, but really respond and change your service offering to meet um, what these customers need. Um, so, um, let me just see. Oh, my slide progression is a bit slow. Hold on. Why is that not going forward? So, um, so the 20, I'm just going to go through this really quickly. It'll take about five minutes, but in, on the 20th of February, that Instagram account, it was a month and a half until Chico de Mayo, which is the big sort of Mexican festival that they all get together. It falls on Taco Tuesday. So they were, they were, you know, understandably excited about this thing happening in about 40 to 50 days from, from that point. Everyone's happy. It's all funny. There's not really too much to worry about out in the world. Um, then from there, um, things started changing. So on February 28, normal day, a reverent messages on their Instagram. It's a bit of fun. Um, but then there was a tornado in uh, um, Atlanta, which was pretty crazy. So they asked their community for help. Um, two days later, they said, stop helping. Um, we're getting too many donations and we can't, um, we can't get them to people. So follow the GoFundMe pages. It's just a little indication that, that, you know, that they had quite a strong community that's, that was around this little restaurant. Um, then what happened? Um, you know, the COVID-19 restrictions start to kick in in Atlanta around March 14. Um, they're saying they're still open, um, but they're starting to, they're already starting to sell gift cards. So for people that aren't comfortable going in there but want to support their, their little local restaurant, they're saying, hey, buy some gift cards now. And I've seen plenty of businesses go out there and use this strategy of saying, well, you know, give us your money now and we'll honour it later when you're allowed to come back out again. So really early in the piece, from an American point of view at least, um, they were sort of pivoting and coming up with some little, little concepts just to respond to the fact that the customers were asking them, how can we help you? And they said, well, you can help us by buying gift cards. That'll work. Um, then, they, then they start going, right, we're not a delivery business at all, but it looks like we might have to do that. So we're going to find this platform called Postmates. So we've gone out and find a platform that'll do delivery and online ordering um, you know, two days later. Um, but then they realized, you know, this is a cantina. It's just not, not, it's not a Mexican restaurant. It's a, it's a bar. And 
people go there and they're known for their margaritas and they, they say that we're not allowed to do takeaway liquor. So, yeah, it's a disaster. So their sign talks about calling the governor to say, go out there and petition to let us have to-go mar margaritas. Um, okay, so now they're, it's you know, a few days later, March 21, they're switching exclusively to call in um, takeout. So they're doing deliveries by Postmates. They're working on online ordering for pickup. Um, we should try to get it launched later. Um, you know, just being thankful to what's going on. Then at the end of that night, <laughs> they're saying, geez, that was a bit rough. Um, you know, there's probably lines out the doors are waiting. People are waiting. They just, they just can't handle the logistics of what they're trying to do. But, you know, and if you go and look at this Instagram account later on, you'll see all the comments from all their followers saying, it's all cool. We understand. At least you're trying. That's what matters. Um, they, uh, two days later, they're allowed to do takeaway liquor. Um, and they end up closing at 8 p.m. because they're completely sold out. So they've, they've opened the doors to getting takeaways, but they just they can't even run past 8 p.m. because they're completely sold out of food and um, and alcohol for the night, which is, you know, that's amazing. Um, so then they, they've moved to, to refining their communication process. So they're doing these. This is a lot of Instagram. This is like their website. Had, like you go look at their website now. They haven't changed it at all. It's probably just too hard. So they're just communicating solely through the channel that they could. Um, and they're talking about, you know, texting in your order, arrive at your car, give us a text and we'll, you know, all this crazy sort of stuff. Um, but then, you know, another day later, Postmates, their delivery service, online ordering service says, you know what, we can't let you order alcohol for our service. It's not it's against our terms of service. So you have to stop that. Um, so it's like, oh God. <laughs> so move back to phone ordering. Um, that'll be fine. And then um, the phones are broken because everyone's now gone from this nice online experience back to phones because that's the only way to do it. But check out this solution that they've got. They've said, you know what, we're just going to put a big pitcher of margarita, which is like four big cups worth and some food for $20. Um, just come up and pay um, $40. Just come up and pay that and take it away. No ordering, just grab and go. Um, you know, just within one day, they've, they've solved that by just saying, we're not even gonna even phone order this stuff. You just want margaritas, come and get them. You know, hilarious. Um, so, they, and now they're doing a lunch, um, but they've been told by the, you know, the, the, the government or the police saying, you can't sell whole pictures of margarita, like of spirit-based mixes. You can't just do that. So they've, they've changed and we can't call them picture packs. They're, they're four, four packs of four smaller drinks. And you can see on the right there, look at the, they're, they're all margarita pictures. Um, they're all margarita um, servings. They're not, it's not food. It's all alcohol. Um, so now they've got an online ordering system that like, this is only, this is only this, this is four days later after Postmates said they can't deliver for them. And you see, they've set up their, their pickup lines out the front of their restaurant um, to try to, to deal with the logistics there. Um, so now um, the public needs more margaritas. So now they've got a delivery driver. Um, with the delivery service, I think from an insurance point of view, they've even said this in the comments, like only the owner of the business was allowed to do the delivery driving because they weren't, they weren't insured to let an employee do it. So they had to go and get all the insurance company to support that. And now they're doing online, they're doing the driver delivery without using this Postmates third party service so they can get around all those um, the liquor laws. Um, I love this one. I never thought my hands would consume more alcohol than my mouth. Um, so they've introduced socially distant ID checking. So you can see there's a, 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 a I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's a, a MacBook with a webcam sitting facing a little table where you put your ID down, but can also see your face at the same time. So people walking up for pickup orders with alcohol can put their ID down, show their faces, and they can check that it matches without having to handle the ID cards and all that sort of stuff. So um, yeah, just every day they're, they're moving through this process and turning it into a well well oiled machine. Um, so now they've got two official drivers. A, a day later, they've got three zones that they're doing. They're talking about um, shutting off delivery if both drivers are out making runs and then turn it on 10 minutes later. So it's really a hacky process. Um, and then um, if you notice on the right hand side, they're also offering you know, yeast, gloves, rice, toilet paper rolls and paper towels. If you want just to add on a couple of um, toilet paper rolls to your order, you can just throw that in. Um, so you know, again, this is, probably you know, less than a month since this whole thing started for them. They've sort of adapted their entire business. Um, then just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, um, someone comes and steals their tip jar from the front of their restaurant. <laughs> and then, you know, within, within a few hours, um, the whole community said, oh, we'll, 
can, can we can we donate all our tips back because it knows it goes to the employees and they said no don't do that just tip us generously on the next order and that's yeah that's a very smart way of saying you know the next order is more important to us than the tips we might have lost with the tip jar um and i thought i should show you some of their food too because it looks pretty nice um look and lastly then at all at all a week ago um you know, roughly a week ago from today was actually the um, Chingo de Mayo Festival. Taco Tuesday actually happened. Um, they were able to do some sort of rough, you know, people were allowed to come up and turn up and hang around for a little bit as long as they were socially distanced. They sort of set up this whole courtyard so people can enjoy the spirit of this sort of Mexican festival. Um, but I love this little line at the bottom saying, yeah, we didn't choose the online order life. They didn't want to be an online, they're a restaurant. They're just a restaurant, a Mexican cantina that didn't want to be part of this whole digital thing. Um, but the online order life chose us. Um, you know, and they've, they they sort of put that message out there. And I think that sort of really sort of um, encapsulates the spirit of what these guys did. And sure enough, they sold out that night and they decided not to open for much lunch the next day because they were so knackered by the whole process. Um, and they'll regroup and, and launch tomorrow. So, look, I think it's it's just a nice little summary of, um, of uh, you know, what, what's what I think is a, a nice... Um, uh, a, almost a, a, a fable about a little Mexican cantina that um, that changed the way um, it worked, so that it's um, so that it, it could service its customers. Um, so, look, the talk the talk today is really focusing on um, a few topics around how any business, whether you're um, direct to consumer, whether you've got whether you're online only, whether you're um, a business to business type um, trade. Uh, business there's all all of these principles that we're going to talk about really follow um, the same the same process um, it's 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 this idea that um, that's in even though we're using all this technology it's the human capital um, and the human approach to things that are more important than anything else right now um, you see that that um, in the example I showed that restaurant leverage technology every step of the way even in the way that they communicated to their um, their customers but the whole point was very human um, and they were willing to be transparent about what was working and what wasn't. Um, and their customers were part of the solution. They weren't part of the problem. Um, and yeah, you know, it's a really important thing. I think, especially when we're really focused on our own bureaucracy, our own politics, our own internal channel conflict, the way that we want to work, all our own staff, making sure they're employed. It's, you can sort of get to a point where it's, it's, it's not by Tuesday or Wednesday of the week that you've actually spent any time to thinking about what your customers need from you. Um, and also, um, as, as you saw there, they were very quick to pivot the use of their staff. So bar staff became delivery drivers. Um, you know, and if you're all not in the restaurant game, but you're more in a, a retail game or in um, some other uh, industry, we've seen plenty of great examples of brands um, repurposing that the humans they have available to them to put them on the front lines, to answer phones, to jump on live chat, to um, respond on social media, um, to ring up proactively call customers and say, how can we help you? What do you need? Um, sort of throwing the rule books in the bin and just, just being responsive. Um, one of the things that sort of comes out of that though, is a lot of people will say this, these concepts don't scale. It's really hard to scale that sort of concierge level uh, approach. And for B2B businesses, they'll say, you know, I'll, I'll use my CRM to, to actively um, push through this. Um, and maybe I'll throw to a poll um, now, um, just asking for people out there, you know, what sort of current customer support do you offer? Uh, whether that's um, client support or end consumer support, how do you offer it at the moment? So maybe just, just check, check all the ones that you currently support for your customers. Um, at the moment just to see how broad the spread is you can choose multiple ones um there we're seeing a lot of explosion in in brands having to quickly adapt uh to more channels because customers um might want to or feel more comfortable talking to brands using different channels um the the trap though is if you don't have the right systems in place that you've got different teams answering on different channels and the message might become inconsistent um, so you really need to be able to tie those those different channels together so that you've got one larger team learning from all the responses, sharing those responses um, and those those ways of working back um, uh, with with the sort of voice of customer team. Yeah, so like I, yeah, emails, obviously a big one. Facebook and Instagram, I think is uh, there's no doubt that people spend half their time, especially now that we're socially distant um, on Facebook and Instagram. Um, interesting to see phones still well and truly up there. Um, 
so often one thing we find when it comes to phone support is a lot of the the quantifiable nature of the support that we get back um sort of saying uh, what was the nature of this this inquiry what problem what theme is it identifying on email and facebook you can generally tag these things but phone op, phone system phone messages don't often get quantified um they just get dealt with um so i think one thing i'd give you here is just making sure that you're quantifying at least the topics um an example might be um identify the top three or four things you think your brand could be doing better for your customers that you know is a pain point and make sure all the customer service people um, in any capacity are making sure that they um, just straw poll the topics. Is it about availability? Is it about order delivery, uh, tracking and delivery? Is it about um, service complaints or whatever else? Straw poll those things across all channels and find out what is the top three things that your customers need from you um, and, and quickly pivot to fix those things. Um, we've seen examples for say a retail brand where they, um, they would have dozens of phone calls, hundreds of phone calls a day to both their physical locations and their head office. Um, once we asked them to quantify, well, what is the main topic? It, it turned out that you know, about 50% of store calls and 40% of head office inquiries were all about just in-store availability. Is this particular item available in my particular size or color at this location? Um, now the e-commerce manager for that particular brands wasn't really interested in building features onto the website that made in-store availability or stock lookups capabilities available to the website because that might hurt my conversion rate of my website and I'm the head of e-commerce. Um, but it was a good half of all inquiries using up all that human time. Um, so it sort of just goes to show that sometimes even the, the KPIs or metrics that we set for our individual departments might sort of push back some customers, customer experience or customer solution solves that might make a lot of sense to people. Um, so I guess that's sort of getting it, getting the data straight there, making sure that wherever possible you're quantifying the nature of what your customers need from you. Um, uh, now, one of the things about quantifying these things is that um, you often end up creating a whole lot of separate touch points for your customers, whether it's whether you're a direct to customer um, of B2C or B2B. Um, so I'll chuck another poll up now that asks about which, which customer facing touch points do you have, um, about which ones of those do you think are adequately connected to a, cent to a central customer record. Uh, we see a lot of examples where they might have a store, a POS and an e-commerce site, but the two things aren't automatically connected. And if you've got manual imports and exports that you do once a week or once a day, they don't count. So I just want to see automated connections between these systems. So if all of us are doing our, um, if all of us have got our strategies in order, then I'd expect all of these numbers to be even. Um, but what we'll probably find in the results is that we'll have some spikes there where some things are connected and some things aren't. Um, and that's probably going to be the first challenge that a lot of brands have is that if they don't have a connected view of customer or a single view or a shared view of customer between these platforms, that it's really hard to get answers to these questions that you're, you're putting forward. Um, so, and I'm sure all of you probably that are in this boat know that and it's on the list of things to do if it's not already connected between these systems. Um, another sort of way to think about this is um, the term single view of customer Yep. So everyone, everyone focuses on the email marketing database and that's, you know, you've got your subscriber pop-ups on the website or um, subscribe now in the footer that generally is connected, but where, it, when it comes down to e-commerce accounts and store accounts and the customer service platform already having visibility of your details, um, there's generally a gap there. And it's a huge opportunity if you can fix that. Um, so on that theme, I think a lot of people talk about single view of customer or 360 degree view of customer being a utopia that people are looking for. Um, one way to look at that is maybe not to think so much about a single view of customer, but focus on the idea of a shared view of customer between these systems or um, a single view of brand for the customer. I think one of the things when it comes to CX strategy or um, digital strategy or e-commerce strategy or anything with this sort of stuff is to try to rephrase, rephrase the problem or the initiative from the customer's point of view. So a single view of customer for a marketing team or uh, the brand itself would be, would be trying to say, I want one place where I can go as a, 
as a business representative or a brand representative and get answers to questions about my customers so that I can solve my problems as a brand. Um, what we're saying is that's, that's a, you know, it's a very noble cause to be fighting for, but it's, it's often hard to get there. What we'd, we'd say is maybe revisit that whole strategy and say what my customers need is a single view of the brand. So when they do log in online, and have an experience, the online system knows who they are and they can pick up where they left off. When they do send a customer service request in or give you a call, that the caller ID says, oh, this is Danny. He spends $3,000 a year, um, but hasn't shopped in the last six months. Um, now answer the phone call and serve that customer with that context. When I walk into store, if you're a direct to consumer retailer with stores and online, um, use the information you've got about me of what I was looking at online, what might be in my wish list, what was maybe in my cart. And rather than just sending an abandoned cart email, show that information to the store team and say, well, hi, I'm Danny Phillips. That's great. I can see you were looking at these items. Would you like to try them on? Um, so it's the same solution, but just framed from the customer's point of view, as opposed to the marketers or the brand's point of view. I sort of call this you know, a line we've used a lot in the past is that, you know, that marketing um, is often using the customers to solve business problems, but customer experience is using the business to solve customer problems. And right now, customers have got more problems than ever, especially the ones that care the most about you. Um, and I guess the next thing we'll get to here is this idea that um, the, your, a lot of these strategies won't work at scale, like I was saying before, because you've got so many customers you might deal with, but all the things that I'd like, like you to focus more on is more the top 10% of customers or the top 20% of customers. What do they need from you? What do they really want? Um, if, you've done, if you've done your analysis, you'll know that that top 10 or 20% of customers probably make up at least half, if not more, of all of your revenue. Um, so rather than trying to make sure that you've got a one-size-fits-all approach for 100% of your customers, focusing on that top 10 or 20% and saying what utility what features, what experiences do they need us to provide to them? Um, I think will get you in a lot, uh, in a much better place um, to be able to serve those people well and to decide what features that you want. I mean, I think if you looked at back at the, the, um, the Rose Pepper can Cantina, they were looking to the people that were bothered enough to, to jump onto their Instagram account and say what was working and what wasn't and responding accordingly. The people that just want to get Mexican once every month didn't care and didn't comment and that's not the customers that they were serving they were serving their best customers so i, I want to see a lot more a disproportionate effort focused on your top 10 20 percent of customers than trying to solve for everyone if anyone follows seth godin who's a um you know the, the marketer's marketer um he's he speaks often about the idea of minimum viable audience that's it's one thing to try to grow and get as many people as possible. Um, but if you just spent more time acquiring the sorts of customers that, that are similar to or look like your top 10% of customers, um, you can become much more profitable uh, far quicker. Um, and sort of leads us to this term that we're, we're sort of toying with at the moment of um, a more intentional economy or a more intentional commerce that now the new normal is probably going to be customers choosing very carefully who they spend their, their time, their touch points, their physical touch points, which stores they're going to visit um, and their money with. And they're going to spend money on brands that have got a very focused offering that are designed just for them um, rather than this sort of, you know, let's try to sell the most things to the most number of people and just hope that the, the, the physics of growth and volume um, will make us profitable when we see plenty of brands working very, very, very hard to open more and more and more and more stores, to have more and more and more SKUs. Um, you know, revenue and turnover is growing like no one's business, but the profits are just disappearing. Um, be profitable and be intentional to a smaller number of people. And I think that's what the market in general wants. I want a good experiences from brands that I care about and brands that care about me specifically. Look, these are all very general um, high level concepts. And, and um, like we said at the start, we really want this to be interactive. Um, so I'm not sure if there's some questions that are coming up yet, um, but maybe before we get to that, let's just find one more, one more, one more poll um, to finish up uh, this sort of 
the speaking at you part of the presentation, um, which focuses on um, how do you get feedback from, from, from your customers at the moment? Um, is it something that's always on, um, like continuous feedback loops, like customer satisfaction or NPS surveys, or, um, or is it more um, once a year, once every five years, once every six months, we go out and do a customer research project or survey? Um, or do you have you know, some concept of mystery shoppers out in the field? Or do you solely rely on anecdotes from the front line um, to, to put into your head that voice of customer so that when you're choosing what you should do next for your customers, what features do you need to build? Um, you know, which of these things uh, influence you more than others? I'll give you a couple more seconds to answer those. I'm finding that sometimes the results here sort of skew towards who's in charge of getting this sort of research, if it's marketing, um, marketing tends to work in a more campaign and cyclical approach. So marketing will generally skew towards customer research projects and surveys. Whereas if it's more operations focus, then we see a lot more continuous feedback lo loops um, and sort of customer service service topic reports, which you know, not surprisingly are, are fairly low on the scheme of things there. Um, anecdotes from the front line, um, you know, they are valuable. I think, you know, you, I think it's one thing to quantify the results, but if you hear um, topics sort of build up um, and, have, and are smart enough to identify some common themes, then it makes a lot of sense. The only thing I'd watch with anecdotes from the front line um, is that you should listen to them. Um, but before you act on them, maybe just make sure that you check that you're not just reacting, you're not just jumping at shadows. I've seen a few brands over the years that um, because they've got a couple of loud voices in amongst their sort of frontline network, whether it be a, a noisy franchise partner or a very opinionated store manager or an area manager from a, from a B2B point of view um, that demands certain things that I've seen brands sort of disproportionately push features or strategies that make that noisy anecdote person go away. Um, but it's not really what most of the best customers wanted. Um, so I think that's just one thing to, to watch there. So look, I've covered, I think um, from here, one of the other just things I'll finish up on is this idea that all these strategies that we're talking about here aren't a response to the whole COVID-19 crisis. These are things that we were talking about before this all hit. If anything, like what everyone's saying, that digital transformation and CX transformation has been thrust upon us. Um, they didn't choose the online ordering life, it chose them. Um, this has kick-started our thinking um, forward by five to 10 years, probably this whole event, but it's something that was going to happen anyway. Um, your customers are ready to listen. Are they ready to work with you on um, changing the way you work? They will try new things if you're willing to try new things um, and your best customers will stick with you and shareholders and consumers seem to be rewarding brands with a plan. Um, you'll only have to look at over in Australia, there's a group called Accent Group. They were very quick a uh, week or so ago to say, we will be opening stores soon. We've got a plan for dealing with it. And we're probably going to close a whole lot of stores as well um, because it makes sense because this is an opportunity to get out of um, underperforming leases and rethink about what retail means to us. Their stock price went up by 20% in a day. On the, on the news of closing several stores, like a good percentage of their store network, so it's because they had a plan um, and because they are public about their plan with their consumers and they've been rewarded by their shareholders. Um, so I think that's, that's the point, have a plan. It might not be the right plan, but I think at the moment, the, the, the community at large is rewarding people with a plan that's public and being acted as opposed to that people are waiting for it to return to normal or people that are waiting for the world to, to sort of deal them their next hands. You need to be sort of out there, out there and pushing forward. Um, so yeah, I think that's sort of the end of the speechy bit of, of the presentation. Okay. So Josh, what, what you, questions ben. have been coming in? <laughs> it makes, um, you're quite right. It's just the, the people who've acted quickly that um, uh, and tested things that are really exciting to watch uh, get those results. So yeah, we do have a couple of questions uh, um, related to your last poll. So. Uh, we've got one from Ben who says, is it bad to do no surveys at all? So, um, Look, I think uh, people hate surveys. That's, that's going to be the thing that gets thrown around. Um, and I think you're, 
So I think by calling it, is it bad to not do surveys at all? It's sort of yes and no. I think if you, if you treat it as a survey and if you send a survey when you need the answer, it's always going to be sort of a, 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 an imposing thing on your customers. I've decided I need to know an answer to a question for my brand on May the 14th. So I'm going to ask as many relevant customers as possible the answer to that. Now that's, I, I think that's a less than ideal because you're, it's like when you, instead of scheduling a meeting with someone, you just call them. I'm hoping you're available to answer my call right now because I need the answer right now. For some people, that's kind of fine. People like that. But I think on, on the most part, people, you need to value and respect people's time. The better way to do that, I would say, um, is to move to a, an always on strategy where you are, whenever we interact, whenever the customer does something with us, whether it be a customer service ticket and we solve that ticket and then we ask, were you satisfied with the response? Or whenever you do make a big purchase in a store or online, thanks for making that purchase. Um, the, the order, we can see the orders now being delivered. Let us know how we went. Is there anything we can improve? So sort of talk to them when it makes sense to talk to them because they've interacted with you, not because you didn't answer to a question. If you can do that, then you're always asking, you're always surveying, but you're never running surveys. Um, you'll always be building up the data and you'll see trends moving and changing and you're responding to customers as opposed to imposing on customers. So that's, I'd, I'd say that's the way to think about it. Just always be asking, are we doing okay? And where possible quantify those answers in a polite and relevant way um, and then adjust your strategies to fit those be benchmarks. And I saw there's another question about NPS surveys, which I think sort of leans into that as well. Um, um, people often confuse NPS and, and customer satisfaction. NPS is a very specific question. It is, it's only one question. Would you recommend us to friends and family? Um, that's, that's it. That's, NPS is nothing other than that with a special bit of maths at the end of it. I think you should be, of your best customers, you should be asking the question, depending on the cycle of your business, um, no more than once every six months. And even that's probably too often. So I'd be asking the NPS question of your customers. And again, rather than sending it on the 1st of August every year to all customers, I'd be sending it about a month after their most recent transaction with you or interaction with you. And if they interact every month, then just don't ask it if you've asked it in the last 12 months. And just, if it's been longer than 12 months, since you've asked the question and they have interacted with you recently, you don't want to send it straight after a transaction. You want to give them a bit of breathing room. So they're in sort of open space to saying, by the way, you know who we are because you dealt with us, you know, in the distant past or in the recent past, tell us whether you recommend us to friends or family or not. And I think if you did that, so that you're again, always asking the NPS question to people at a consistent point in time from their last interaction with you, that benchmark would then sit. And that's a, it's a great leading indicator of the health of your entire efforts as a brand. Um, so yeah, I'd always recommend that running an like a, a first party NPS um, questionnaire in that mode is much better than um, pulling the trigger on a, a set date each year or each month, because for some customers, it's not consistent from the customer point of view, because they're going to be at different parts in their cycle. They might've just bought yesterday or just had a bad experience yesterday. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that's my sort of approach on NPS. Cool. Uh... We also have another follow-up question uh, from Diane saying, we ask our customers to do a product review by email, but want to also ask about us and our service. They don't, uh, she doesn't want to do two requests. Would you put them together or? Yeah, I think with this sort of stuff, I always like the, the progressive approach. Um, when, when it comes to say join forms, if you're like, I want to join on the website, ask the thing that you need to know the most first. In order to create an account, we need an email and um, name and maybe gender or uh, a preference and then once you've pressed submit that's great thanks very much and while i've got you can i also ask this and you don't have to because i've already got the information i really need so if you use a platform or a process that allows a stepped approach saying you bought this product we really as a privilege of being a known customer us we'd love your feedback giving feedback is a privilege and for a lot of customers they say oh thanks brand for asking um because if you don't ask maybe i'll just go complain on facebook so you know give me a place to do it direct so please review this product you've just bought. Great. And let them submit that. And then the success page should say, well, thanks for submitting that while you're here. Would you like to also comment on you know, the store and staff that you bought it from and the experience you had there? And if they go, yes, that's great. You can say, oh, great, that's great. Would you also like to go review us over on Google Places reviews so we can get some you know, good public responses to that? And they don't have to, they can always say no at any step of the way. But if they keep saying yes, it's because they're engaged and they appreciate you caring 
no one's going to complain about choosing to say yes because I can say no if they don't want to. So I'd always just do that progressive approach. And if it's a no and I'm unhappy, tell us why if you like and submit that straight to your customer service channel so that all the negative stuff goes straight to a customer service agent that can reply. Um, so that, cause if you don't, they're going to go to public. If I get crickets from you, I'll go to the internet and talk out loud with my megaphone because generally I get a response there. Thanks, Danny. Um, and Dave has asked about what you think about feeding back customer responses as a summary to the customers. Um, is that about um, maybe is, it, is that about sort of servicing? Um, I mean, if you're doing a, a customer service, feedback, obviously you, the results of the question you're going to give back to the customer. But if you're saying that we've got a, an average satisfaction score of 22% and you make it public on the website, um, look, I'm a big believer in, in, um, in trust um, more than transparency. I think if, if you feel like you need to be transparent, um, I had an experience recently with a car repairs place where the whole place was plastered with their NPS score and their CSAT scores. Um, and you could tell that every single person that worked at that place was bonus based on their CSAT scores. So, you know, they always check, are you happy? Like you could almost hear them say, so will you give me a good score on that survey that you're going to get tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Like it was literally, and you, you see, I think even Telstra do it. It's, you yeah. know, before you go, you will get a follow-up call. Please make sure you answer it or, you know, get in an Uber and you know, please give me five stars. Um, I, I think, sometimes being too public with that sort of stuff can have unintended consequences to your team. So I think it's that make sure you get the balance right there. I think it's great to ask for the feedback. If you can, if you can surface it in a way that makes sense for the, for what your brand offers. Um, if you're trying to use, I mean, it's the concept of social proof. So you're trying to say, look at all the other people being happy with our service. You should be happy with us too. Um, I think you just got to be careful that it doesn't, that doesn't come along as, um, sort of virtue signaling or just sort of self gratification, and it is something that benefits the consumer um, in that respect. So, yeah, it's not, a, it's not a black and white answer, it's a bit nuanced, um, but I hope that answers the question there. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Danny. Just uh, while we wait for a couple of other cute questions to come through, um, and if anyone's got sort of specific um, situations they're grappling with, please shoot those, those in if you're happy to share. I was just wondering, um, often or I have sometimes seen customers uh, of NZTE, they, they often will have some data already, but um, they may not be using it uh, at this point or haven't been up until now. So for, for a company that's really searching for data to get started with or might feel that their data is, is probably not up to scratch, what would you suggest right now? So. Yeah, look, I think data and insights and analytics is one of these things that um, really can get you into a, a, a very sort of, not destructive, but just a, a pointless loop. Um, uh, it's this whole sort of what can I have, what do you want is a loop when it comes to the data. I think the way a person that works for a brand needs to think is you need to assume that you've got a lot of data because you probably do. You probably have more data than what you think. And maybe it's in disparate sources and maybe getting, um, getting it grouped together might be harder than it should be. But if you go to the people that are in charge of the data, whether it be your IT guys or your, you know, your marketing data guys, and say, where are my reports? I need insights. That's, that's not a question. There is no report. There is no insights dashboard. Like, stop asking it for that way. What you've got to do as a practitioner, as a senior person, is go, I've got a hunch. I've got a hypothesis. I've got something i've got a question a very very specific question that i need answered how many people that shopped with me for the first time last year uh, under an account as a known customer um, and spent money with me last year haven't shopped in the next year like how many customers really joined in 2018 and didn't shop in 2019 at all they went to all the effort of giving us their details giving us some money taking home our product they didn't just buy off the street and didn't come back next year. That's a number. It's a, it's a question that can only be answered with a number. That's the sort of approach I feel like he's still missing in a lot of businesses, asking specific questions. And it might, you might not be able to pose the question as specifically as that yet. You might go, what is ret retention? I feel like retention is a problem for us. So maybe we should dig a bit deeper on the concept of retention. But it's your job as a practitioner to, to get to a point where you can ask a specific question that's going to output a number or a chart. 
um, that the insights person, the data person can't draw the chart for you. They'll try. Do you want this chart? No, that's not what I want. And some people will go, well, I'll know it when I see it. So give me some charts and then that'll, that'll raise more questions. And now I'll go back in again. So, but I think that's, it's lazy. I think that the real thing that I want to see from, from practitioners is, you know, stop and think and ask a smart question that can only have one number and answer. And you'll find that your, your IT guys or your data guys go, oh, that's a great question. I know exactly how I can answer that. I'm going to have to pull spreadsheets from seven different systems, but I know exactly how I'll do that. And they'll take pride in answering that question for you. Mm. And then once you do that every week, you go, right, great. That's great that we can get that answer every week, but we're sick of trying to pull that from seven spreadsheets. So let's operationalize that fact and let's surface that data to my area managers and my store teams in real time because now they can act on it. They can act on it, not um, at the end of the month post-mortem report. It's an active dashboard that I can use. But it all starts with questions. Mm. Everyone thinks analysis and insights is about answers. It's not. It's about questions. And questions don't come from the data guys. They come from the practitioners. So hopefully all the people that are on this call, uh, you know, my challenge to you is come up with at least two or three really smart questions or hypotheses that you can ask of your data and take it back to your business. Say, can someone answer this for me? Um, uh, and just, uh, just using that example I used before about how many customers returned. For a lot of our retail brands that sell you know, fast fashion or apparel, it's about 40%. 40% of people that went to all that effort of joining in 2018 came back in 2019 mm. so to my to you know for me that's like what's the point what's the point of subscriber pop-ups what's the point of you know i'll get my commission if i sign up 500 people in store this week you know all that effort and none of them came back and spent any money it's ridiculous mm. it's a whole lot of effort for no good reason so um you know if you can change and we know that retention is a great one to focus on because it costs 20 percent of what it costs to acquire a customer to keep one but I'm not seeing many brands spend a whole lot of time on retention. There's some, I think there's more um, questions coming a, in. Yeah, it's a really good question uh, as well and feeds into Courtney's here. Um, one quick example, if I may, I was, on a, I was speaking to a fellow who had worked at Zero, and what they yep. focused in on was uh, the indicator that each new sign-up would become a paying customer. So they honed in on and they were eventually able to identify that if a, a sign-up person added their bank account within 24 hours, they knew that that person would become a paying customer. So there was a yeah. very specific behavioural trigger that they could see. So what they were able to do then was focus their customer service people on their follow-up information and emails uh, in that first 24 to 48 hours to try to get as, these people who, who have um, signed up and registered to add their bank account. So it was a very yeah, successful um, question to ask around, you know, what's, what's the behaviour that, you know, is common amongst people who sign up to be a paying customer? Yeah, so, yeah, and don't just report on it as a post-mortem. Once you know it, like, you know, re how do I repurpose three support agents whose sole job it is is to look for someone who's created an account but hasn't added their bank account and I get on the phone and help them? Because yeah. if they do it, they're done. Um, yeah, yeah li live chat for websites too. I think, you know, if you're a yeah. retailer and you're not repurposing your store team as, as live chat, chat agents right now to help people through that process, then you're missing yeah. a huge amount of money. Yeah. So on to Courtney's question, which is similar. Um, uh, what ways do you see as the most successful to capture new engaged customers to your database? So again, we were talking to a lab equipment company the other day who had exactly this issue. So, Yeah, look, I think the first thing I'd say about this, this sort of comment too, is just like wherever possible, never call it a customer database or a CRM or those sorts of things, even internally it's, of course, there is a database that stores your customer records, but getting increasing the number in that database is not a thing. It's a byproduct of good customer service and utility. Um, I'll give you an example, um, whether it be B2B or B2C. Here over in Australia, we've got JB Hi-Fi. Um, they've started building a loyalty program by stealth, effectively by saying, you know, these, these receipts that you lose that you really need to return stuff. Would you like me just to send them to you by SMS? They know that email address is hard, full of typos, um, and they change often, whereas mobile numbers just work. So how about, um, and they would say, would, the, the script originally was something like, would you like me to um, 
um, can I have your mobile number? And to start with, I'd say, can we add your mobile number here and you'll get an e-receipt? So it was add to the database so you get the e-receipt. But then in the end, they got rid of all that script and just said, um, not would you like an e-receipt? Can you please, please tap your card and can you give me your mobile number so I can send you the receipt? And everyone goes, yep, that makes sense. Logical, done. So it's not, like, it's not about adding someone to a marketing database. It's adding their details to provide them with utility. That's the way. The best way to make it so that you have more people in your marketing database as a result is to provide utility to customers that only works if we know who you are. Mm-hmm. So when you walk into a store, um, have you shopped with us before? Great. What was your name? Danny Phillips. I'll look you up. Oh, no, doesn't look like I've got your details. What's your email or mobile while you're browsing? So I can get that in there and I can save um, anything that you like. And I can, mm-hmm. and if you try things on, I'll save your size details in there. So even if you leave without buying something, you'll get a receipt for this interaction of what we've just done. It's not, I'm not joining you to my marketing database. And if you use the term marketing database in your head office, your store teams will use it too. They'll say, can I join you to my database? Cause apparently that's important to someone at head office. So just to throw those terms in the bin, provide utility to known customers, your, your marketing database will happen as a result. It's a pleasant byproduct of providing great customer experiences. Right. A couple of ones there. Um, Paul asked what options uh, exist if you if you can't have a formal CRM system. So. Yeah, yeah. I look. I, I'm a. I actually don't like the term CRM. Um, I, I think it was. It's designed. I mean, for B two B, where you where you're managing twenty to two hundred to two million dollar deals, um, and you need to actively manage a life cycle with a highly engaged customers, where you're tracking every single email backwards and forwards and follow up actions for your sales teams. A CRM is a tool for sales teams. Um, it's not a tool for customers or customer experiences. Mm. I think the best options that you've got are just to make sure that each of your systems and their touch points, so your customer service platform, your e-commerce platform, if you've got one. Um, and again, don't put in your marketing email database anywhere near this. And your in-store experience just has a nice, simple method for collecting the identifiable information as part of the service. If it's a website, have a set of categories or features like pre-order that's only available for known customers. So log in to see this stuff. Um, I've got pl- we've got some of our brands that don't do guest checkouts. I mean, and what is a guest checkout anyway? It's just the, the ability to not set a password. If I put my details in for an order, then you know who I am. So save that information. Um, people just might not want to automatically opt into a marketing email, that's all, but they're definitely your customer. So they should be in your system. So I find that you could describe a CRM as a collection of tools that capture customers' information. Um, And when you've got questions to ask of those three or four data sources, combine them on mobile or email and get your best, your best guess answer. Yes, you might have a bit of scrappiness around the edges if someone signs up with email one over there and email two over there, but at the end of the day, those numbers won't be, won't be huge. And the customers that really engage with the brand and spend most of the money with you, they'll make it their business to make sure that the version of me that's online uses the same details that uses me in store because I as a customer won't benefit unless that history is together for me. So scrap it together with the tools that you've got. You don't really need to buy a CRM. I don't, if you haven't bought one now, you don't need to buy one. What you do need to do is just come up with ways of connecting um, your systems so that when the customer has an experience, they can, they or their agents, which is your store, your frontline team can pick up where the customer left off. That's all. And you can do that with a lot of elegant hacks to get mm-hmm. things moving. And if you ever want to get things connected together, shameless plug for yeah. Omnio.io, which is our customer data platform and customer experience platform, you can go and use something like that if you need to. But, um, but I think you can, you can make a lot of mileage with the tools you've already got. And I've left this on a little while because um, it's a really great question and we get it a lot from New Zealand um, companies, is that um, they're a B2B business uh, and thinking of going to uh, direct to con- customer, so B2C. So how accepting are retailers? So, you know, they've obviously been going through retailers. How accepting are they going to be at that direct to consumer approach? This, this has been a bugbear of mine for, for a decade. Like I think, um, and I'm, yeah, I'll probably, I'm sure I'm going to upset people in amongst all this sort of stuff. If you are a manufacturer and you create a product that you're proud of and that customers buy, it is inevitable that you will sell those things directly to consumers. That's inevitable. And you will have to do things to make that experience as amazing as possible. If I want to buy that product, 
I should be able to buy it from the person who cares the most about it, which is the person that makes it. The end. So you are obligated to create an amazing direct-to-consumer experience for your absolute best customers. Um, my family loves Carmen's gluten-free muesli, right? Um, now, I buy it from the supermarket, but you can buy it in bulk only from a certain number of play- places. And if I could buy it direct from Carmen's directly on their website, I would. I can't yet because channel conflict and look after the retailers and blah, 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 blah. Um, but I'm sure at some point I will be able to. And there's plenty of other FMCG brands that I can buy direct from the, from the, the source. Mm. And they're not undercutting and they don't need to. I don't need it cheaper. I just maybe want it in more convenient packaging sizes and all, all sorts of other things. Um, if you're a retailer that stocks other people's products, you don't sell products. You sell a service. You sell curation. You sell the ability to bring together things from all over the world and all over the internet and tell a story about them and sell them. You as a retailer that sells other people's products will always exist. And you shouldn't be threatened by the fact that some of the brands that you stock are willing to sell directly to some other customers that are different to your customers. Your customers buy you as a service. All you sell is service. So if you, if you're relying on the fact that you've, you've managed to find and source 50 different really interesting products, but you've got shit customer service, you don't answer the phone, you don't have live chat and you don't have options for servicing those customers, then you won't exist because it's all you've got is your service and it's valid and it will work and it can be profitable. Um, Minimum viable audience. If you're a little shop or a collection of shops that sells 50 different brands worth of stuff, carefully, carefully curated, um, you will do well. People want that. People want little mini department stores that, that, that feel like my taste and you've stocked the different things that I find that I'll happily give you the money any day of the week rather than going directly to the brands. But for someone else that doesn't know you, doesn't live near one of your physical locations that love this particular product. So like for me, I like Bellroy wallets. I love them. I know I can buy them all over the place. My last one I bought from a little store that is here in Brunswick that I do appreciate and love but the, the other thing I bought recently, I bought directly from Bellroy and I might tic-tac between the two and I'm still, I'm still a good customer of the Bellroy brand. Um, don't fight it. Don't spend a minute dealing with channel conflict. If your retailers start getting upset at you for, for selling direct, just tell them to focus on service. Um, that's their job. Um, and if they don't like it, you know, it's, it's a case of keeping your friends close and keeping your enemies closer sometimes. But I think really there's enough, there's enough customers that want what that, retailer has to offer and there's enough ones that want what the brand has to offer and they're often different people um and you shouldn't mm. be if you're spending all your time trying to mm. deal with kickbacks and oh, if we sell to someone that's in postcode 23 then i'll make sure you get 1.7 percent of that like no like mm-hmm. you're spending all your time trying to service um this thing and there's a great case study from i think it was a l'oreal brand over in um in france where they were really carefully trying to manage channel conflict but they picked they picked a particular region where they said you know what channel conflict doesn't exist everyone just fights for the best experience of the customer and we'll see what happens and it worked really well they they were they were, they were able to prove that if the brand focused on servicing the customers that wanted to shop direct and the retailers focused on shopping uh, on servicing customers that wanted to shop retail then we all made more money and if, we, if we spent all you know, five hours of our week working out fair deals to, to maintain channel conflict that, that's five hours you're not spending on servicing your customers I know that's a long answer to a specific question but i'm very passionate about it fight hard for your customers yeah. sell direct so you've got a big thank you there so from yeah. anonymous <laughs> but no i Thanks. think um, quite a, quite a few points there that are also really um things that i'm passionate about as well i think the often the online shopper is a different shopper to the one that wants to go to to a retail outlet and um you know, there's lots of unique value that retailers can offer in terms of the convenience well, of choice yeah. and immediacy of purchase and, you know, being able to take yeah. that product away. So, you know, I think everyone I, working together I, is great. I'd like to think, I'd like to think that that anonymous attendee came in as an anonymous because they're even too scared to ask that question, which is exactly <laughs> my point. You know, <laughs> what if my retailers are also watching and they freak out because I'm even asking that question. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's exactly my point. I'm, I'm, that's probably not the reason, but, Mm. let's just go with that it sounds more, yeah, it sounds more good. But anyway so we're, we're almost out of time so we, we don't have uh, any other questions there to answer so I just wanted to um, say thank you again Danny so I've um, 
already received a note saying how fantastic uh, the information has been. I just thought I would summarise again in terms of the, the three key uh, points you've raised for um, <laughs> um, why you are exactly right, Danny. There you are. <laughs> that person was too, too scared to ask. Um, uh, so interesting. So um, the key points that that you've gone through are, you know, firstly thinking about your human capital in the business and repurposing people who are potentially not as fully um, utilised at the moment as they could be in other areas. So. If getting people on the phones is what's needed right now, then you know move some of your people over. Um, getting your data straight. So thinking about what sort of data you, you have actually got and how to ask those really good questions that um, people can extract from the data sources that you already have. Um, really honing in on what your customers, your best customers, I think, need from you right now. So you know, really knowing who your top 10 or 20% of customers are that are most profitable to you and trying to fulfil their needs to the best of your ability. I think it's a really great way to focus at the moment and, uh, and learning really how to make it easier for those customers to access your products and services. So regardless of what type of business you're in right at the moment, it's all about people still want my product, service, etc how can I make it easier for them to purchase it and how can I get it to them at a time when they're going to be more understanding that, you know, if it's delivery, it won't be within 24 hours, um, you know, those sorts of things, but keep them informed. Um, and then things to think about as, as lockdown eases. I'm not sure we've, we've pulled many of those out, but I think if you've got those first four, four areas sorted, then um, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll almost find it quite easy to set the future of your processes um, if, you've, if you've really done those first four aspects. Yeah, I think the, the last thing I'd add is just that um, it's, being from a digital agency, I think we've been guilty of bamboozling a lot of businesses with the, with the possibilities um, of what technology can bring. Um, and you know, called sort of paralysis analysis. You know, but, um, you, you, can, you can really be sort of paralyzed by possibilities of what te technology can do. You are the brand, you are the business, you know what you stand for and you know what customers value. Your job is just to articulate what you want to deliver for your customers and the way the experience should work go to your technology partners or your agencies and they'll say, the answer is yes, we can build it and we can build it quickly. If you say, if you go out with an RFP for a big new e-commerce site, it's going to take forever. Just describe what experience you want customers to have. Your agency partners or your in-house tech people will be able to build it very, very quickly. If you can articulate, I just want it to do this and not that, just it needs to do this and I need it to do exactly this. Um, not what can I have? What can I have? Because you can have anything. You can have anything you want. So just describe what you want right now to service the most valuable customers right now and get someone to build it for you and get it in market, learn from it and do it again. You know, just build it, iterate. You know, I don't want to use the word agile, but just, just get it out into market and learn. Everyone's going to be more tolerant than ever of maybe a few missteps. But if you're trying and getting it out there, but you know, I've seen I've seen so many examples of websites and e-commerce businesses popping up in in weeks. Um, the platforms are out there to support you, whether it be Shopify or Big Commerce or any of the ones that are out there. They can do it so quickly if you're willing to jump. Um, often it takes a quarter of the time to build any of these things than the time it takes you to decide to do it. The hardest thing is the decision to act, as Amelia Earhart once says. Um, so just choose to do something and start doing it. Excellent. And our last question from Ben, what was the name of your program um, oh, yeah. and your business? Yes, yeah, so it's Om, 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 Omnia. Yeah, so Arcade is our agency. It's a CX agency, Arcade with a K, um, arcade.com.au. And the product we've developed is called Omnio, which is O-M-N-E-O.io. Um, it's a customer data and customer loyalty platform. Uh, for multi-channel retailers, but it can extend to other other categories as well. So if you want to talk to us about that, and we'll put some details in the show notes as well. So you've got those. Um, we'll contact Jocelyn directly and she can um, pass on your details if you want to talk to us. But yeah, happy to talk to anyone anytime, um, even if you want to just shoot the breeze on ideas um, without, I won't try to sell you anything, I promise. <laughs> Excellent. So thanks, Danny. Uh, I can assure everybody Danny's been very generous with NZTE and 
uh, is a fantastic resource for to, uh, talking things through. So, and, and really has great results for the, the, their customers. So uh, thank you all very much for joining. We've just hit um, midday in New Zealand, so it's time to sign off. And uh, as Danny mentioned, we'll send out a follow-up uh, to provide you with any resources uh, that we, we think have come up during the call. So have a great afternoon for those in New Zealand and uh, look forward to working with you all again. Okay. Thanks so much. See everyone. Bye.